how do you see newer developments in neuromodulation and neurostimulation coming along in psychiatry? Uh, what can we expect to see in the future? Many things. I think on one hand, we're hopefully we'll see that, that it will be expanding uh, into wider categories. And I, th I would really hope at some point in time that there will be applications for, uh, for non-treatment resistant depression, because I think it can be helpful there as well. And maybe that uh, by the time it becomes more cost efficient as well, uh, that, that can really something to be uh, considered as well. Uh, I would see that other indications would come along, but I don't think that TMS will be the magic cure for all. In my view, all neuromodulation techniques will have their own niche application, mm -hmm. if you will. And we know that neurofeedback can be very effective in treating some specific sleep problems in ADHD. Uh, TDCS might, fi might find its own niche. TDCS is transcranial direct current or transcranial alternating current, which applies a small current to the brain. Uh, TMS will have its own niche. Uh, so it's really like panning out which technology to use in which specific set of complaints. Secondly, what I also would hope, uh, which I've been uh, working on for a long time, is that we can finally get rid of the labeling, mm -hmm. and the labeling into the DSM categories, which we know map very poorly, poorly onto biology. So we need to go into symptom clusters or research domain criteria uh, in order to really achieve a future of individualized or personalized medicine. Um, and of course, I think the technology has a long way to go. And we're mm. still working with huge machines that are still quite costly. Uh, and I think that can be improved to some degree uh, to make it way more accessible to clinicians. Um, yeah, and what I see is that as a clinician, uh, you have a toolbox and your toolbox has medications, has psychotherapy, has mindfulness, has CBT. And I would think and hope that in the future, clinicians would simply add this as one of the tools into mm. their toolbox. And that's really where I think we can really s start expanding the toolbox of psychology and psychiatry uh, mm. to create a much more effective treatment for the patient mm. in the future. That's fascinating. I mean, it, th so there, there might be a possibility in the future where specific biological parameters um, might indicate response to a certain neuromodulation techniques, for example. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of pharmacogenetics, is there any sort of sort of research that actually shows specific individuals are more likely to respond to say RTMS or otherwise? No, honestly, I'm, I've looked at the pharmacogenetics or the genetics component of the personalized medicine uh, with considerable interest, mm -hmm. uh, but it's been very sobering. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a long time ago that we've deciphered the human genome. And I think the main reason for that is that the human genome tells you one aspect. Um, of the story, but there's epigenetic changes as well. Mm. And from the genetics, we cannot derive which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off. And because we know that environmental influences have a very profound impact on, uh, on psych psychiatric disorders and eh, like trauma and other uh, influences, I think that the epigenetic role uh, is probably a much bigger role, plays a much bigger role in, um, in psychiatric disorders as well. So, so far there's not been any consistent evidence where genes are predicting treatment response, although there are, are quite some big studies out there. STAR-D was one of them. Uh, we are working on the iSpot study with over a thousand patients. Uh, and so far, I'm not aware of single genes or mm. constellations of genes that purely predict treatment response. The only pharmacogenetic work that's out there is informing you about the type of dosing to use. Mm. People are fast or slow metabolizers, but that's not as much tied into efficacy from my perspective, but more into the dosing uh, aspect of it. I think that te techniques like the EEG, uh, maybe the MRI, but it's still quite costly, uh, or maybe techniques like what we refer to the neurocardiac guided TMS, will play a much more profound role into guiding people to, to the right treatment. Uh, they're really feasible to apply in clinical practice. Um, and I'm still fantasizing about a future where an mm. uh, iPhone-like device is held against mm. the head of the patient and the doctor will say, okay, you're gonna go for TMS, this protocol, and you're gonna go for that medication. Mm. That would not be my ideal future yeah. Yeah. Uh, of getting a real readout of the brain and treating the brain. As yeah. many people jokingly say about the psychiatrist, he's the medical doctor, the only medical doctor that does not first inspect the organ he's treating. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we need uh, to develop towards the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating, because uh, recently there was an article that looked at um, patients sort of doing their own stimulation. Is, is that, has that sort of come to a point where um, devices are being sold? 
Well, maybe, maybe to some degree, your your iPhone twenty one <laughs> will be able to do TMS as well. That you feel that it signals already that you're not doing too well, and rather than putting it to your ears, you put it to a specific place. Maybe, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Let's not jump to conclusions too quickly because I think we first, to begin with, need to be careful. Yeah. Uh, we need to do no harm, uh, and we should not put this in people's hands too quickly, uh, because I think it's too early for that. We need the right developments. Uh, maybe at some point in time that becomes a reality. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, this absolutely fascinating um, conversation. <laughs>